And I'd like to introduce Patrick. So great that you could come. I hope that you enjoyed your trip to Ostrava and here in Prague. And here it comes. Do I need it? So, something like this. I can't hear my own voice. It's like the worst thing. Um, hi guys. Uh, as you may or may not know, I was just in Ostrava at the um, World Bush and the Czech, not the World, that's in Gotham Way, the Czech Bush Championship, which was absolutely awesome. Um, I had a presentation there as well, right? And I was supposed to have a presentation here today as well, right? Uh, about coffee, naturally. Um, but I'm going to give you guys two choices, right? Because I know that some of you actually saw me talk yesterday in Ostrava. And that could be a bit sort of boring to hear me talking about the same stuff again, right? So two choices, right? The first, the sort of title of the talk I was supposed to do here is How a Koi Fist Changed My Life which is a bit corny and a bit strange, but it's basically a story about how I ended up in coffee and how I ended up here right now talking about coffee. Working with coffee, roasting coffee at Five Elephant in Berlin. And for a lot of people in coffee or that wants to enter coffee, there's no clear infrastructure for how you do that. You want to work in a bank or you want to you grow up and you say, Dad, I want to be a soccer player. There is a process for how you can become a soccer player, right? Or if you want to work in a bank and so on and so on. But if you grow up and say, Dad, I want to be a coffee roaster, that's not really a structure for how you end up there, right? So even we talk about that, we talk about how I ended up in coffee. Uh, we're going to finish up with just some open questions about coffee, roasting, brewing, green coffee, coffee shops, whatever you guys want to ask about. Or second, we're going to talk about Pepsi because Pepsi is awesome. Um, we're going to talk about diversity in coffee. We're going to talk about segmentation in coffee. And we're going to talk about how I think sharing and caring or collaborations is where we have to be in terms of progressing this industry. So it's basically going to be totally up to you guys because I don't have time to do both of them. They're going yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're going to take like 20 minutes each because honestly no one wants to listen to anyone speak for more than 20 minutes, regardless of what they speak about. Um, so 20 minutes each and open questions afterwards. So the first one, um, koi fishes, how I ended up in coffee, um, a lot of inspiration. Second one, diversity, segmentation in the coffee industry and sharing is caring collaborations. Can we have some sort of race of hands here? So how many wants to listen to the first talk? Raise your hands. Hi, hi, hi. Okay, but that's, that's sort of a win already. You guys don't want to listen to that? Come on. No. Uh, so second talk, just for a show of hands. Okay, so I'm sorry, we're not got it. You want to hear that again? Chloe so already heard it. Jesus. It was good? Yeah, cool. So, okay, I guess we end up with the koi fish, right? Um, so, where do we start? We start from the beginning. So, I'm 19 years old. I'm sitting at a lecture in this tiny coastal city in Sweden, right? Um, I'm studying to become a project manager. I basically get three-year studies with a two-year master afterwards, right? I had an extremely set plan for exactly how to do it. Um, I knew uh, I was supposed to buy my first car. I knew what I was supposed to buy into my house and my dog. Uh, I had this awesome, clear structure for my whole life, which a lot of people have, and it's a very beautiful thing. Um, but I ended up in this lecture, and it was time for internship. And all of a sudden, this professor comes in, and he basically says that, well, we have five different places where you guys can apply for an internship. And he started to, you know, slowly, slowly, you know, read from a list. So this bank up in Gothenburg, I come from Sweden, 
um, this sort of event bureau that works with music festivals up in Stockholm and, and so on and so on. And in the bottom of that list, he basically stopped. And he said, well, we have this crazy guy as well. Uh, and he has this entrepreneurial contest that he has in Sweden and he has it in San Francisco. And it's sort of a huge thing, but I have to worry you because last year when we worked with him, we got a bit crazy and a lot of people don't really like him anymore. Um, but they basically said, if you want to, if you want to work with him, what you have to do is that you have to apply as soon as possible, right? So I thought that that sounded absolutely amazing. So I was basically standing up, walking out the door, the teacher asked me where you're going, said I'm, I'm applying for this internship. So I went straight to him at his office in Gothenburg, knocked on the door, and I ended up doing an internship for him. So why is this important? It's going to be really important. Because later, um, almost, yeah, almost four months later, still in the internship, I'm standing on this huge parking lot in Gothenburg. If anyone here is going to, is anyone going to DOC? You guys are. This huge coffee festival in Gothenburg. Um, I was standing in this huge parking lot, which you guys probably got to stand on as well. Um, and I got this phone call from my boss. Gustav, who was the owner of that, you know, entrepreneurial contest that I was working with. And he basically said, hi, Patrick, um, I know it's sort of a short notice, but I need 5,000 euros tomorrow. And I was like, okay, yeah, and I need you to get it for me. <laughs> okay, so I'm 19, you know, 5,000 euros is quite a lot of money. Obviously, I'm not going to pay him that. Uh, but we did have a structure for getting customers, right? Um, and I basically looked around the parking lot and I saw this, you know, little coffee shop in the corner. Um, so I walk over the big parking lot into that coffee shop and the first guy I meet, his name is Mats. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of a road street and coffee shop called Damateo. Uh, he's one of the guys that started the VOC in Europe. And I just looked at him and said, hi, I want to talk to the owner. And he said, well, you can talk to me. And then he asked me, what do you want to talk about? Uh, and then I said, well, I need 5,000 euros tomorrow. <laughs> and he just looked at me and was like, okay, well, that's sort of a lot of money. It's like, yeah, it is a lot of money, but I have a great pitch. So we sit down at this table and um, we had this huge discussion and I'm pitching. Basically what we're doing is that we're um, we're trying to innovate companies, right? We're trying to pitch new ideas to companies, right? And we do that by taking in a lot of young entrepreneurs into the room, pitching ideas of the same problem, right? And being in the specialty coffee world, at least now, you realize that a lot of people have the sort of same problems again and again and again. And so I was talking, talking to him about this, you know, we get this all new, new cool perspectives on your business, you get a lot of good branding and so on and so on, because it was sort of a huge competition at the time. And um, I ended up walking out that door with 5,000 euros, you know, which was pretty cool. And it was extremely relevant because about one month later, it was time for competition and the structure was very simple. We had small competitions across Sweden and this huge final where we got the best entrepreneurs to come down and compete, right? And we had five different companies throughout the day with 10 teams coming in, pitching solutions to their problems. And, you know, we've, we've done this for quite some time and we were getting quite good at it. And all of a sudden, you know, it's competition day, it's final. Uh, I spent my whole day at that Mateo in the registry because I was sort of the guy that, you know, got them to work with us. I wanted to make sure that everything worked beautifully. So the, the sort of problem we had to solve was how do you communicate specialty coffee to a customer? And how do you communicate specialty coffee internal? Like, how do you make your baristas understand what it is we do? Which is not super easy, you know? And so we ended up just sitting there and hour after hour and after hour, these teams are coming in, you know, and they've been to, they've been to Volvo, they've been to, you know, every major company in Gotham are pitching beautiful ideas, very talented people. Then they came into this registry and everything they pitched was totally bullshit. And I just sat there and I just watched them and just listened to them and it was so bad. 
because no one ever understood specialty coffee. No one understood what they were supposed to pitch, you know, which is a huge problem. So I ended up in the end of that day uh, going up to Matt saying that I'm sorry, but this was absolutely terrible and you just paid me 5,000 euros. And he just looked back at me like, yeah, it was absolutely terrible. What, what are you going to do about it? And, you know, still 19 years old, you're not super cocky. Uh, and I was like, well, I can fix it for you, you know? I'm going to work for you. I'm going to work for you for free and we're going to make sure that we answer all of those questions that our competitors couldn't answer. And he looked at me and was like, yeah, fine, sure, let's do that, let's do that. So, uh, two points. That sort of pitch and me getting that customers in led to me taking over that company, right? Which, in terms of how I ended up in coffee, is extremely important, right? So we have both the company and we have both Damateo, right? So now we're just gonna fit them all together. So, basically, we had, or I had three years in that company as CEO, taking over the company because the guy who run it didn't want to do it anymore, which was sort of simple. And the main pitch in our company and the main pitch that we work with was to more or less engage young talent with established business so they could, in a very quick way, try to understand what they actually wanted to do in the future, right? So we had a competition format where the winners would be sent to San Francisco, more precise Silicon Valley, right? So, you know, if you win the competition, you come to San Francisco with us, you hang out, you know, at Facebook, at Google, at Twitter, uh, and so on and so on. And then for anyone that's sort of into business, that's sort of a cool thing to do. Uh, and we had a lot of fun doing that. And throughout that same process, also, every time I traveled, I went to Matt's and I asked, so where should I drink coffee, right? So regardless of where I ended up in the world, he just told me, well, drink coffee here, drink coffee here, drink coffee here. And I did that, right? Which basically led to me starting to understand the specialty coffee industry, starting to understand what kind of people it was working there, right? And finally, I think it's around three and a half years ago now, uh, I ended up in San Francisco again, uh, and I should actually take off my clothes now because I have a tattoo of the koi fish I talked about. Um, I ended up in San Francisco again. Uh, we traveled around to you know all of the companies I just talked about. We visited the new headquarter of Facebook and Google and Twitter and Airbnb and so on and so on and so on. And that was really fun. And when you're out meeting companies like that, you start asking yourself, how do you guys succeed? Because we've been running this company for three years. First year was absolutely fantastic. We did make some money, which you know is a good thing. Second year, I sold everything I had in my apartment. Everything. Slept on the floor for six months and got an extra, uh, extra job in this clothing store in Gothenburg uh, because we couldn't afford anything else because we didn't have any money, right? And the third year was an absolute success because it, this is a different story. Um, but it, it ended up being good. But you know, you go around to all of these companies and you wonder, how did you guys succeed? Because they work a lot. Like, sweet, like people think that sweets work a lot, you know, which we sort of do. But these guys work you know, 15, 16 hours a day. They don't take weekends. One of the most interesting people we met was uh, Rick Ed Stryper which was back then the global marketing manager for Android at Google, which is, you know, top 10 executives on Google, more or less. And he worked for Google for like 15 years or something, and that year was the first year that he ever got weekends off, which is crazy. So the question is, how the hell can you do it? You know, what's the inspiration, what's the drive behind working that much and excelling to that kind of level in quality, right? And the answer was simple, super corny, but very simple. You have to love what you do, right? Which is an incredibly easy thing to say. Everyone can say it. But actually doing it is a bit more complex, right? So again, I found myself in San Francisco, of course drinking coffee at all the cool you know, coffee shops. Um, Cyclass was the coolest one back then, at least. Not now. Um, and I went every day to Four Barrel 
which is on Valencia Street, this huge sort of cool hipster street in, in San Francisco, which, I don't know, is a good coffee shop. And they're pretty cool because when you come in there, you have this huge bar um, with two espresso machines facing towards each other, where they just, you know, punch out a lot of coffee, incredibly a lot of coffee. And to the left, you have this slow bar. Very easy communicated, this is a very slow bar, right? And it is. You have about 40, 50 minutes, which is, is a very long time. But it's fine, because you're in San Francisco and people like to talk, right? You're not in, in Berlin or in Germany where people would probably not talk to you. Um, so it's perfectly fine. And I keep on going to, uh, to this coffee shop, day in, day out, because I like the coffee. And one of the last day, this barista asked me, so are you competing next month? And th this was before I knew anything about coffee, right? Never made a coffee in my life, drank a lot of coffee though. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, well, there's this barista competition. And I said, well, sorry, I'm not in coffee. And he just looked at me, well, I thought you sort of, you know, you're, you're drinking coffee a lot, so I thought you were sort of into coffee. Like, no, no, I'm not, but, you know, tell me a bit more about this competition. He said, well, in the U.S., we have this thing called, you know, the, the U.S. Barista Championship, right? And I'm going to compete in like a month from now. And that sounded awesome, right? It's a competition. It's cool. I like competitions. So I went back to Sweden. Uh, and the first thing I did, uh, you know, after uh, landing at this terrible, tiny airport in, in Gothenburg, um, I just went to the registry. I went to Matt's, knocked at his door and said, hi, I heard about this barista competition. It sounds awesome. Uh, and he said, yeah, yeah, we're, co we're competing in a month from now. Um, and they were hosting it, like the local sort of Western South competition in Sweden. And I was like, I have to compete. And he asked me, do you know anything about coffee? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, that's fine. Um, so we set up this awesome structure where I spent basically from, from 4 in the morning to 6 in the morning before I went to the office. I was in their little lab at Dan Mateo, uh, which was hilarious. I remember the first time, because Matt has this incredible uh, personality where he sometimes makes a lot of decisions without really uh, talking to anyone else in the company about it, because he do owns the company. So the first time I was there, 4 in the morning, and I met, I met Christian the first time. He came in at 6, watching this random person standing in the lab brewing coffee. Uh, and he says, who the fuck are you? What are you doing in here? It's like, I'm brewing coffee. Matt was like, Matt's told me. And he's like, oh, tip, typical Matt's. And he just walked away. And, and basically, I, I was in that lab for a month every day. I didn't know anything about coffee. Like, a machine like this was like a, you know, a spaceship. I didn't realize, this is, this is a rather simple one, but the one that I used was a two-group Linnea uh, Classic, which you know, has a shitload of different buttons to press. You know? And even a, a Mesa grinder like that was you know, incredibly difficult because I didn't know what to do. You know? I realized you have a filter, and then you need coffee in that filter, and I realized you have to put it in the machine, and you press something, and coffee comes out. <laughs> you know? Which is the, still the basic structure today. You know? It's not that complicated. You grind coffee, you pour water on it, and then you have coffee, right? It's not super complicated. So I was in there for, yeah, for, for a month more or less. The most, imp the most interesting thing was the milk steaming. Shit, steaming milk is complicated. N not today, but if you don't have anyone to show you how to steam milk, then steaming milk is complicated. Trust me, it's messy as well. Um, but I had a lot of fun. I ended up competing. Um, and I, was, I didn't suck, I think. I didn't come last, which I was sort of happy about. Um, so I competed. Um, and after the competition, Mats came up to me and said, well, so when is it time for you to work with us? You know, which is you know, a reasonable question to ask. And I said, well, I have this company. You know? And when you're, how old was I then? Uh, I think I was 21, I guess. When you're 21 and you make a lot of money and you have a CEO title and you have to, you know, you can go to San Francisco every year or so, hang out with Facebook, then you know, starting with coffee doesn't, you know, doesn't really, doesn't really sound that sexy. It doesn't, no. Um, but anyway, uh, again, we have this foundation where we we work with three years 
trying to sort of get people into doing what they love. That was our main pitch. So the question after he asked me that was, well, do I love to do this? I, I obviously have a lot of fun having this company. We have a lot of fun. We meet a lot of good people. It's a lot of good connections, but do I love it? And that's a huge difference, right? I spend basically, I think we average like 17, 18 days of work, hours of work a day, which is, you know, reasonable for, for what we did. And I just one day realized that, well, uh, maybe I love coffee, which is also incredibly corny, but I think very true as well. So what happened in that process is that I ended up talking to my colleague and we were uh, at then let's see we were seven people employed in Gothenburg and we had franchises in ten, 10 different countries we started up in San Francisco we started up in Sydney as well which was fun um, over that period of time and one day I just came in and said well I'm gonna quit and he just looked at me what, what are you gonna do it's like yeah I'm gonna probably do dishes for six months uh, and he's like cool awesome because Again, that was the whole process of what we did. We're trying to figure out exactly what we wanted to do, and we tried to get people into that right environment as well. So we had a four-month process where I basically handed over the company. We did a classic TED structure, if you guys know what TED Talks are, where we put everything online and said, if you guys want to do this, you know, give me a call. I tell you how we did it. We're not going to help you because that's too much work, but we're going to give you all the information that we have, all the network we have. And I handed that over, and four months later, I was, you know, at Dan Mateo in this tiny little coffee shop in this Victoria Passage, which you guys are probably going to go to, and, you know, doing dishes, uh, brewing coffee, and uh, I had a lot of fun. And that sort of slowly escalated into me, you know, practicing a lot, doing a lot of stuff. Six months in, I was in the roastery. A few more months, I was competing, 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 placing quite good. Competitions is the solution to a lot of things in life, I think, even though a lot of people hate it. But it's an awesome way for anyone to, basically what a competition does is it forces you to spend time doing something, right? And I'm a huge believer in this sort of 10,000 hours rule. Spend a lot of time doing it and you're gonna be best. It's quite simple. Everyone that ever wins a competition has, one, failed more than you have, for sure, because you always fail more than you win. Two, practice more than you. Easy. If you nail those two things, fail enough and practice enough, you will probably end up winning, right? Um, so, yeah, I roasted a lot of coffee. Uh, I worked hard. Uh, I was trying to understand where I would end up in coffee, and uh, yeah, here I am now. I've been doing five, six competitions since I started. Um, I've won two of them, lost four of them. Um, I did the London Coffee Master last week, which is awesome, and I can highly recommend it for, for you two or any other barista in the house, because uh, that was really awesome. Um, I started roasting coffee in Berlin six months ago, seven months ago, cool. It's good that you <laughs> know that. Uh, roughly seven months ago, and uh, yeah, that's more or less um, what I do. Um, yeah. Do you guys want to know anything else? So that was basically the short story about how I ended up in coffee, why I do coffee. Um, basically, if, if you guys want to have more approach about how brewing coffee, Google would do a better work explaining that than, than I would probably. Um, but I'd be happy to take any kind of questions whatsoever um, about running businesses in Sweden or about coffee or, you know, Silicon Valley, I don't know. Um, go for it if you guys have any questions. Come on now, don't be shy. Someone has a question somewhere. No? No one? Can I ask you? Definitely. Funny enough, as long as you're not from Australia, it's super easy. <laughs> no, but it is seriously because they have this. Uh, Chloe knows because she's from Australia, but they have this um, uh, like barista school thing in Melbourne and Sydney, I guess. And so many baristas from Australia wants to go to Berlin now, so it's almost impossible to to get a visa, if I understand it correctly, which is a bit messed up. 
Uh, so I think if you come from anywhere else in the world apart from Australia, you'd be pretty set. That would be quite easy. I do know that a lot of people prefer if you know German, or at least when you get there, really take your time to to learn and not to be able to communicate with customers and so on. But apart from that, just go for it. Definitely. Come. Oh, the coffee monsters. It was, um, so for you guys who don't know the background behind the competition, is basically in the world we have seven world championships, which are all awesome in their unique way. Um, but there's been a lot of sort of critique amongst those competitions, being not sort of open enough for the public, the public don't really understand what's going on, and so on and so on. So these two guys, Rob and Vic, decided to, well, let's change that. So they made this uh, competition where you have um, five different steps during one hour and 15 minutes up on stage straight. Straight? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You start cupping six coffees by. So the first is single out uh, the right coffees. The second one is take that coffee and brew that coffee. And then you work with that coffee throughout that one hour and 15 minutes, still not knowing if you're pitching the right coffee, but you know it's a coffee you pitch. Uh, so it's basically take all the world's competitions and just put it in one and do it in one hour and 15 minutes uh, And you do it with one person like if I would make coffee here Then you know James Bailey would stand over there and make the same coffee So you have this you know uh, competition and this live judging so After it's a knockout round so if you guys go up against each other Then you know one would win and the other one would not be in the competition anymore uh, Which is super fun it is a lot of fun. I can recommend it to anyone. Uh, it's absolutely exhausting because in four days I did, since I ended up in the final, I did four, yeah, four competitions in three days, which is, you know, almost five hours of competing, uh, which is, you know, for you guys, you, know, you did the Brewers 10 minutes yesterday, and that's also sort of, you know, it's a lot of emotions, a lot of stress that sort of, you know, gets out of there. Yeah, you know, it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit easier, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, so imagine London is like barista, but with ten more stuff in it, and you know, more chances to fuck up and more chances to do good stuff. Um, but it's just a lot of fun. The only problem with it is that they have a lot of art thing. They have this lot of art guys with six sort of incredibly complex lot of art patterns, and I suck at lot of art. So that was that was a, a bummer, but uh, it was fun. I can recommend it for sure. And they're gonna have one in New York now, in September, I guess. And then they're putting one back in Europe, I think, next year. So get in touch with Vic or Robin and, and do it. That's my suggestion. Yeah. yeah, do it, do it. Anything else? I am gonna hang around a bit, so people are allowed to to talk to me afterwards if you guys want to. Or we can take it now as well. Chloe, you didn't have a question yesterday. In no, Did you? No, no, you should definitely touch briefly on the Pepsi thing. It was interesting. Oh, and the, I'm, we're talking about Pepsi. So, so Pepsi is sort of a long story. Um, it is. But, but, uh, no, I can't talk about Pepsi if you want to. Um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a quick run at this and see if you guys get it. Because uh, it get, it's not complicated. It's a bit weird. So. Howard Moskowitz. Does anyone know who that is? No, no one ever knows who that is. <laughs> no. That would be cool, though. That would be cool. They're equally awesome. They're equally awesome. No, this is the guy that uh, Pepsi, you all know Pepsi, at least, of course, right? You have Pepsi and you have Coke. If you, if, you, if you sip both of them, Pepsi will be more tasty than Coke. But if you actually drink a whole can, Coke is more. Uh, more tasty because Pepsi has a bit too much sweetness and sweetness is perceived as very positive if you just sip it but if you drink a full can you want to have a coke right but uh, Howard is this amazing gentleman who is basically his whole, whole profession is based on measuring things so when Pepsi in the 1970s wanted to do diet Pepsi for the first time they were trying to figure out how much sweetener do you want in a Pepsi right and they figured out that somewhere you know, below 8% is not enough sweetness. 
and somewhere above 12% is a bit too much sweetness, right? And back then, if you had Howard's job, you would make it very easy for you, and you'd go in and say, well, that's easy, you pick 10, right? 10 is in the middle, right? But Howard didn't really approach it that way. He, he did it a different way, which was really interesting. And he went across the world over that year and just had people drink a lot of Pepsi, right? With a various amount of sweetener into it. And he ended up back a year later when Pepsi asked him, right, so what should we do? What's the perfect, you know, diet Pepsi? And he said, well, there is no perfect diet Pepsi. There is only perfect Pepsis. Because his pitch was that people, everyone in this room doesn't like this one special thing, right? If I serve you guys a coffee, beautiful Kitiga from Drop Coffee, great coffee. Um, not everyone in this room will like that coffee, right? So his pitch, which they didn't understand back then, was basically if we translate that into coffee, there is no good or bad coffee. There is no perfect or imperfect coffee. There's only different kinds of coffee that suits different kinds of people, right? So that was the main pitch that he was trying to tell, and they didn't listen to it. But in the 1980s comes two spaghetti sauce companies, uh, Ragu and Prego, and that was about the only two companies that existed back in the US, you know, in the spaghetti sauce market back then. And, you know, uh, Ragu was famous for, for having you know, a slightly higher quality than Prego, because Ragu, if you poured it on, on pasta, would stay on top. And Prego would just, you know, basically went through the, the, the pasta and end up in the bottom of it. That's a huge, you know, important marketing test they did. And basically, Ragu came up to, uh, to Howard one day and asked him, well, well, you know, we need the perfect spaghetti sauce. We need more market shares. And he just looked at him, he's like, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. There's only perfect spaghetti sauce. And they just looked at him like, are you crazy? He's like, yeah, probably. But then he worked together with, with the kitchen team. And he, he actually produced 45 different varieties of spaghetti sauce. Again, in a time where the total population of the US eats two different spaghetti sauces, right? Two. There's a lot of people in the US, right? Um, and he, he made 45 different. And he went through, over a year, again, sampling, you know, taking people in in truckloads, having them sample these spaghetti sauces. And he came back to, to Ragu and he said, well, you know, this is what I've collected. And it turns out that the American people likes three types of spaghetti sauce, right? So if you, if you do clusters, right? So plain spaghetti sauce, extra spicy spaghetti sauce, or extra chunky spaghetti sauce, like big bites, you know? Why not? And um, so the, the CEO of, of Ragu came up to him and you said, you're telling me that a third of the American market craves extra chunky spaghetti sauce? And he was like, yeah. But we don't have that. No, no one had that. So it turns out that no one understood that you know, 30% of the huge market wanted a completely different product that didn't exist. So Ragu made an extra chunky spaghetti sauce and they made over six billion dollars uh, the next coming years of, you know, extra chunky spaghetti sauce. And like today, that, that seems totally irrelevant, but Howard is the guy and the reason why when you go into a supermarket now, you have, you know, 20 different types of milk, you have, you know, 15 different, you know, variation of salt, you know, because that's obviously important. You have a uh, hundred different coffee filters. Um, you know, you have such a big diversity in products, right? But then you go into a coffee shop, right? And you, this guy has just been in New York, so he knows this as well. You, you go into a coffee shop and you look on their offer list. It could be a grocery or a random coffee shop. And you know, I could, with my eyes closed, pitch what kind of coffees they will have in this coffee shop. Which is not a critique, it's a fact. What I'm trying to pitch that in coffee, this rule of diversity doesn't really exist, right? 
because almost all of the roasteries are producing, you know, the same coffees. Now comes Ethiopian and Kenyan coffees, you know, and you know most of the roasteries are also buying coffee from the same uh, green coffee sourcer, which is which is awesome in a way. But we have ended up in a situation where, regardless of where I go in the world, if I if I go into a specialty coffee shop, I already know what they will offer me, right? And there's one big problem with that, because that sort of states that we already understand and knows what our customer wants. And I would say that that's bullshit, right? We spend so much time searching for this perfect roast profile, this perfect brew recipe, as you guys know. Uh, you know, this, this perfect grinder, EK43, yes, awesome. Um, you know, perfect espresso machines. But Howard already taught us that there is no perfect coffee. There is no perfect roast profile, right? There's only different profiles that suits different kind of people, right? So the question is here, when you know, you know come now, we're gonna have, you know, roasteries are gonna have a Colombian, you know, cool, tasty, an Ethiopian, probably two. Some will have washed, some will have also have a natural because that's a sort of a crowd pleaser. Uh, the Brazilians are getting out of date, so people won't have Brazilian you know, over the summers and start to use some El Salvador in the middle of the summer. Uh, you know, probably two, three Kenyans from each roastery. Uh, roasted lighter and lighter, more approaching the same way, you know, 200% development for life. And um, I'm just saying, why don't have five different profiles on this one Kenyan golf, right? Why not offer this diversity to the guests? Because we don't know what people like. People don't know what they like, right? Which is, is, is a huge problem. But yet, we're as roasteries and coffee shops are you know, singling in on the same thing. It's copy paste, it's copy paste. Some coffee shops are way cooler than others, but you know, in terms of, if you disregard the surface, you know, the content is the same, right? Um, which is why I like this place, because this is obviously something new, which is cool, uh, definitely. But I'm just saying that we need a bit more diversity, and the history have already taught us that diversity is the way to approach a new market, right? Does that answer to your question, Ken? Further? A long answer, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. But now you guys had sort of the two talks, didn't it? Short versions. Anything else? More about spaghetti sauce? Yeah. Um, so yes. Yes. A short a short answer. Like yes, do it. No, but that's that's the main thing. Like we and I know this because I roast coffee almost every day and you know, I'm, um, roasters and baristas are incredibly, um, what's the English word? Like when, 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 a, when a roaster is roasting coffee, they're aiming to do something that they like. When a barista is brewing coffee, they're aiming to do something that they like, which is awesome. The only problem is that they're not the ones that actually drink in the coffee. Uh, so it was an incredibly pretentious industry, this, where we, you know, continuously, as a groceries are, I would argue, with, a lot of people will hate me for this, uh, but I'm going to argue that anyway. Um, like, a lot of the groceries are roasting more with the aim of getting other coffee roasters to like their coffee than getting their consumers to like their coffee, right? because it's a bit cooler, and we as copywriters sort of think that the consumer doesn't really understand it anyway, so, you know, I'm gonna do it my way, which is the best way, and, and that's just wrong. That's just terribly wrong. Like, we're so, there's almost a, no other industry that I've seen that is so far disconnected from the guest. Because um, there's still, which is, you know, perfect in a way as well, like, we're educating our guests, which is perfect. But educating should be, well, coffee can be this and this and this and this. Education shouldn't be, you come into my coffee shop and I'll make the best fucking coffee in the world, period. You should not drink coffee anywhere else. Uh, and that's unfortunately how I feel that a lot of companies are doing it. Not all of them, 
and this is just as much as a self critique than critiquing anyone else. But um, you know, if if we would make forty five different rose rose profiles. You know, take a trip across Europe and have people sample it. I think we would learn a lot of interesting stuff that we don't know today. That would be my, my main pitch. Yeah, that would be fun. Good. Um, is, is that a question uh, sort of focused on, on here in Czech or as a broader sort of perspective? Yep. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No one knows about Australia. Yeah. But they can get describe it. I think it's just trying to improvise. I know there's a lot of houses already open in Vienna, in Paris, 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 um, yesterday, actually, and it was sort of also struggling to answer that because it is a rather complicated question to answer. Of course, you can you know look at market shares, you can look at the increased interest in you know knowing more about the products that a normal consumer would you know more about the product. I would say the answer is way more simple than that. I would say it's simply about the people, right? We right now it's happening this year and. Well, what I discovered when, you know, when I worked as a consultant for, for Damateo as well and, and traveling, meeting people is that, you know, people in specialty coffee is awesome. Uh, you know, they, more precise because the majority of the people in specialty coffee is in specialty coffee because they love it, right? And when you're working with a product that you love, you're going to put in a shitload of work. And I think that what we're seeing now is just a result of all of our work. So a lot of you know um, cities and countries around the world are just very sort of they just have the right people. And I think we we talked about this before me and Chloe as well. That's why I love coming to Czech because I feel that in some cities already people are starting to get a bit you know, like the baristas are getting a bit uh, you know they they're into coffee but they don't really love coffee. It's not as fun anymore. It's not as exciting. And then you spend a weekend in, in, you know, on Ostrava in Prague, and all of a sudden, you know, everyone you meet is like, coffee is awesome, you know? And you don't really have that. That's sort of a unique thing here. Um, and, and you guys are going to progress faster than I would imagine a lot of the other European countries doing, because they don't have that sort of same thing. So I would say, you know, and, you know hipster culture, again, also a good thing. Why not? Uh, beards and tattoos. and. Um, you know, having this interest in knowing more about the product, of course. But I think that the the most honest answer would be that we, you know, we're lucky enough to have people that want to start up, you know, these coffee shops, these roasteries. They want to, they found something in specialty coffee that they love and they want to, you know, communicate it. And I think a lot of, you know, old school coffee shops, you know, they're, they're a shop that, you know, they may love the social aspect of a coffee shop, but they don't really love the coffee in the same way. So, um, it's a love story, I would say, in a way. Is that a good answer? Uh, I don't know. Anything else? Come on. Should we wrap it up? As a, I'm going to hang around here for, for a few more minutes before I have to run to the train again. Uh, I think. What's the time? Yeah, it's fine. Perfect. So thank you guys.
I'm happy to be here. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>